Welcome to another beautiful episode of Healthy Living, reaching you from the nation's capital, Abuja. I am Olamide Al Hassan. Now, the establishment of a regular menstrual cycle is an important process for an adolescent girl. Psychologically, it's a sign of becoming an adult and a factor for female identity. While physiologically, it means normal function of the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis and the system of sexual hormones as a basis for future fertility and reproduction. Now, disturbances of this regulatory system usually result in frequent gynecological problems. It is, however, important to identify the cause of such abnormalities early to prevent clinical consequences. Today on the program, we'll take a deep dive into menstrual irregularities, focusing on causes, possible risk factors, signs, symptoms, and possible solutions with an obstetrician and gynecologist, Dr. Miriam Hassan. You're welcome. So the studio, ma'am, you're welcome to healthy living, even though you're joining us virtually. How are you doing today, Dr. Miriam? Hello, Olamide. Thank you very much for having me on the program. I'm glad to be here. And today we'll discuss about um, menstrual irregularities in women, in adolescent girls, because um, uh, it's a very important topic that is not discussed well. So today we're going to talk about um, how um, menses, how the, the fact what affects um, menses and what leads to menstrual irregularities, the signs and symptoms, when to know uh, when you're having menstrual irregularities, what to do when you're having them, when to go and see your healthcare provider, the investigations that you do and the um, treatments that are available. Thank so you we're, so much. Um, an, we're going to discuss all that today. It's an honor to have you. So I think we should just begin from the very scratch by talking about what menstrual cycle actually entails before we go into all the details. All right. So um, to have a better understanding, it's, it's best to start from, um, you know, the beginning. So uh, for menstru menstru menstruation to occur, there has to be, um, just as you said, the hypothalamic pituitary um, ovarian um, axis, it has to be intact. So menstruation is tightly controlled by the brain, the ovary, and then the uterus. And the, 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 the process is being controlled by hormones that are secreted from the, from the brain, which are then transported to the ovary, and then which now act on the uterus. Um, basically, um, about four hormones play a role in menstruation, which is um, the follicle-stimulating hormone, the luteinizing hormone, which are secreted from the brain, which are then transported to the ovary, and then where estrogen and progesterone is now released. So each of these hormones has its own function. To, okay. um, to, to, uh, the first uh, hormone that I would like to discuss about is the follicle-stimulating hormone. This hormone is uh, released from the brain and is transported to the ovary. Here, the function of the hormone is that it recruits follicles. Follicles are unmatured over that are present in the uh, in the ovary, which okay. when they grow and then as if there is sexual intercourse, there's ovulation, then the, um, fertilization of all leading to pregnancy. So um, if this hormone is released, it now acts on the ovary, leading to the growth of these follicles. So um, as these uh, follicles are growing in the ovary, they, they, they now release estrogen and progesterone. So the estrogen now uh, starts preparing the uterus, you know, for, um, for should there be uh, fertilization of the ova leading to uh, implantation. And also the progesterone now makes the uterine lining perfect for, it, for, for implantation of, a, of an embryo, should there be fertilization. So, um, in situations where fertilization does not occur, the ova that was released is now absorbed into the body. And then these hormones, the estrogen and progesterone, they now go down. And then the cycle now begins uh, again with okay. the lining that was formed initially by the estrogen and progesterone. It's now, um, it's now uh, shed as menstruation. So the menstrual cycle is divided into four phases. We have the menstrual phase, which is the phase of the bleeding, and then there's the follicular phase, which it's kind of overlaps between okay. mes menstrual phase and follicular phase. Because as you're menstruating, a new egg, a new ova is formed for the subsequent cycle. Okay. Then after the egg is formed, then we have ovulation. And then after ovulation, then you have the luteal phase, which is preparation for another 
uh, menstrual cycle. So this is the normal uh, stages in which each um, it, that is followed during each cycle. So uh, if so there's there any problem the affecting days? any stage, any okay. stage of these uh, phases of menstruation, this can lead to menstrual irregularities. Okay, um, the four phases you just talked about, what could be the differences in those stages? I mean, how many, do we have days differences? How long do they take before they graduate from one phase to another? Well, yes, there is a, there's a differences in the duration okay. and this varies from woman to woman. It's not oh. a fixed duration. Okay. Um, the, the stages, as I've mentioned, there's the menstrual phase, the follicular phase, the ovulation and the luteal phase. The luteal phase is, um, is, is the one that is constant. It's 14 days for every woman, but the follicular phase varies. For, for some, it might be 10 days, for some, it might be 12, 14 days. It can vary. It can vary from 10 to up to 16 days. And then the menstruation also varies from woman to woman. That's, that's the period of shedding. Some women have menstruated for two days, while, while some menstruate for three days. But the average duration of the menstrual phase is two to seven days. And then the ovulation is the same for everyone. Ovulation occurs in once in a month for every woman and it lasts within 24 hours. After that, the period of ovulation has passed. If the ovum is uh, released from the ovary, it gets absorbed within 24 hours. Just 24 hours? Yes. <laughs> you know, some persons believe that ovulation could take up to 72 hours. No, no. Ovulation takes 20. Once the ovum is released from the ovary, it spends 24 hours, and then if if there is no fertilization, if there is no sperm around to fertilize it, it gets absorbed into the body after 24 hours. Okay. So what are the signs and symptoms that one should see to believe that, oh, I think I'm beginning to experience some sort of menstrual irregularities? Okay. I'm looking at the, the, normal, the normal pattern of menses, you know, the duration, the, the duration of the, the, the flow, the, the dates in which you, the menses flows, and then the menstrual cycle as a whole, and then other symptoms, you now uh, know that, okay, I'm deviating from the normal. So the normal uh, duration, the average duration, as I've said, is not the same for every woman. So we, we work with average. The average uh, menstrual days is two to seven days. So if a woman is having a menstruation of less than two days, that means it's, uh, the flow is scanty and it's not normal. And if the duration is more than seven days, getting to 10 days, then that, that's normal. That means um, the bleeding is prolonged and probably heavy. And then uh, if bleeding in between menses, it's not normal. And then uh, the, the menstrual cycle should be at least minimum 21 days from the day you start your cycle to the next um, cycle should be uh, within 21 days. So the average is that it should be within 21 to 35 days, up to 40 days is so much. So a, a range of 21 to 35 days is okay. So if you are seeing your menses every month and it's not up to 21 days, then that is not normal. And if you're seeing it more than 35 to 40 days, you're not seeing your menses up to that duration, then that means uh, uh, you're having some menstrual irregularities. And um, also, before you say you're having um, menstrual irregularities, it has to be um, consistent. You, you have to be consistently seen it um, every other month for at uh -huh. least three months. Because for at least three months. I was yes. going to ask because I, I know of some occasions where some persons would yes. say, oh, yes. I saw my menses two weeks ago. And because I, I went through some rigorous stress, it came again. Yes. So I wanted to yes. ask. So at that point, should you already be scared from a first attempt? No, no you, it has to be. It has to be if you are, you keep having it persistently for three months, uh, it's it's still maybe if the duration is reducing or increasing for three circles, that's when you say okay, I'm having menstrual irregularities. And then also the the flow is important. Some have heavy menstrual flow, so um, the the average amount of blood loss every month should be between eighty to hundred mils. So. An average um, sanitary pad to be used per day should be three, should be at least three pads. So if, okay. if you're using more than like five to seven pads in a day, then that means your bleeding is heavy. Or if your your pad is soaked within an hour, or if there's uh, it's associated with severe pains or passage of clots, 
passage of blood clots that are as big as the size of a coin or bigger than the size of a coin, then that means your bleeding is heavy and you need to go to the hospital for a checkup. You know, when you, when you were describing how much blood um, is needed to be shed out um, monthly, I was wondering who measures it. But because you <laughs> had to now describe using the sanitary pad, I think it makes a lot of yes. sense. Yes. So are there yes. risk factors that could prone one into menstrual irregularities? Sorry? Are there kidding? other risk factors that can prone one into menstrual irregularities? Yes, yes. There are risk factors that are associated with menstrual irregularities. I, like you said, stress. Stress can affect the, uh, can make you emotionally, psychologically, physically. So, and as I've mentioned earlier, it's a, menstruation is a function of the brain, the ovary, and the uterus. So, if, if there is uh, a lot of stress, this can reach, lead to um, change in the pattern of hormone release from the brain, and this can alter the normal hypothalamus, pituitary, ovarian axis, leading to menstrual irregularities. Other conditions associated with hormonal imbalance could be um, like uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome is one of the common uh, reproductive um, metabolic disorder that affects women. Um, uh, in these days, it's associated with menstrual irregularities and then um, conditions also like uh, thyroid disorders, hypothyroidism or hypothyroidism can lead to menstrual irregularities. And then if a, a woman is on certain medications like um, antipsychotics, antidepressants, or even uh, contraceptive pills before the body adjusts into to that changes um, of you know taking contraceptive pills can lead to menstrual irregularities. And then uh, pelvic inflammatory disease like the gonorrhea and chlamydia, they are, also, they are all risk factors. They can affect the ovary, they can affect the uterus, leading to that uh, imbalance. And then um, there are uterine factors, diseases that can affect the uterus, like um, uterine fibroid. Um, it can cause um, bleeding in between menses. It can cause heavy bleeding. And then also um, endometrial polyp, which is a, uh, like a, a, a non-malignant uh, group that, it's, uh, that can be found in the uterus. It can cause um, menstrual irregularities. And then endometriosis, it's also a uterine factor that is associated with irregular menses and also severe menstrual uh, cramps during uh, the menstrual period. So these are some of the, um, you know, causes and risk factors that are associated with menstrual irregularities in women. All right. Um, I have often heard a lot of women say that sometimes the period comes this month and probably till the next two, three months before they experience the period again. And then they tend to have other menstrual pain. They tend to have menstrual pain as well. And when they never used to experience it so is this some sort of menstrual irregularity beginning to come up and are there um, signs of some underlying conditions that probably have not been looked into okay uh, you see missing missing menses in in a month or two is a sign of menstrual irregularity even though we said it has to be persistent for at least three months but uh, so but if a woman misses her menses then and she's not pregnant then definitely there's something going on Okay. So um, one of the common cause of um, uh, menstrual irregularity is hormone imbalance from PCOS, that's polycystic ovarian syndrome, and it's um, one of it, the symptoms of this um, polycystic ovarian syndrome is an ovulation because if, if the, the hormones that are responsible for ovulation and menses, if there is imbalance, there won't be release of an ova every month. So meaning if there is no release of an ova, that means the, the cycle won't be as it's supposed to be. So that's the, the reason why they tend to skip some months. And then uh, after, for some, they, they might, it might take them three months, six, up to six months before, um, before they, they menstruate. So it's one of the symptoms because of the, the anovulation that, is, that they, they have. And then other symptoms that, may, that they may experience together with uh, the absence uh, of menses is um, they, they may experience acne because one um, because uh, the other hormones that are uh, implicated in PCOS is increase in testosterone which is an androgen so with that with increase in testosterone uh, these uh, these patients tend to have um, growth of ex excessive growth of hair in the face in the chest back and then acne there is a hoarseness of the voice okay and then um, there's 
um, excessive weight gain and then difficulty in losing weight because as as they are gaining because of that uh, hormonal imbalance there is there's a, it's associated with um, insulin um, insensitivity and if a woman has insulin insensitivity it's difficult for them to lose that weight and the more they have the weight the more the presence of uh, estrogen and testosterone making uh, the cycle to be and the hormones to be to not be in uh, in the normal way that is supposed to be leading to the irregularities that they're having. So if a woman presents with a menstrual irregularity, you have to ask her um, how it started and other associated symptoms so as to know which of the uh, which of the underlying factors is she having so as to rule out um, other diseases and also to pinpoint the cause of the irregularities that she's having. All right. Um, thank you so much for your time so far. There's something I noticed that um, a lot of women believe, and I want you to confirm if, it's, if you have to affirm it or refute it. Most women believe that um, menstrual cycle is associated with acne, a lot of other dramas, that uh, health-wise, you know, a lot of things that happens physically to the woman. Uh, I, 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 can't, I can't pick all of it, but I know that acne is one of them. So do you think that yeah. the menstrual cycle is in any way associated with this? Some persons even feel like they gain weight through the period. Some persons feel like they eat a lot. Some persons feel like they have diarrhea. And some persons would always say they get acne from menstrual cycle. How true is that? Yes. It's, uh, these are all symptoms that can be experienced during the menstrual cycle. However, it's, it is, it's not everyone that experiences these this, uh, symptoms. There's even a condition called premenstrual syndrome. It's associated oh. with all these physical symptoms that you mentioned and psychological Alongside mood anxiety, swings. How did I forget to mention that? Mood swings, especially. Uh, irritability, depression, all, all of that is associated. And this is because of the hormones because of the hormones, estrogen and progesterone. As I've mentioned to you, uh, if you are, uh, if you are, um, as the, ov ov the follicles are being recruited to, to grow, you know, to grow to lead to ovulation, there's release of estrogen. There's release, uh, so this estrogen uh, is responsible for all those uh, symptoms. It's responsible for, uh, for the bloatiness that some feel is responsible for, for the breast tenderness, breast soreness. It's responsible for, you know, increase in gastric motility that can lead to diarrhea, but it's not present in all women. Some experience it and some don't. In fact, some women will even say they think they are pregnant because these are pregnancy hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And for that period of their menses, it's a little bit spiked, but it will go down. Not as in pregnancy that when it starts rising, it continues to rise until you, you have your baby. But in menses, just that period of little spike in the hormones can make you have all those symptoms. And then once the um, ovulation has occurred, the symptoms will now go down because everything is now going to be, uh, you know, expelled as menses. That, would that mean that almost every woman experiences what it feels like to be pregnant during their menstrual cycle? Yes, yes, something like that, actually. <laughs> All right, let's dwell a little on PCOS. Can you please help us shed more light on it? Because it sounds like it's a huge reason why most persons even experience infertility. Well, for polycystic ovarian syndrome, the, the exact cause is unknown. But it has to be with uh, it has um, some genetic, you know, link, family history um, associated with it, and then uh, lifestyle, um, because this is uh, PCOS is commonly seen in women that are obese. So uh, your lifestyle choices can um, can can put a woman at risk of developing polycystic ovarian syndrome because sometimes you have the genetic uh, risk of developing a disease, but if uh, you are having a healthy diet, a healthy weight, you might uh, you know be skipped and not have uh, that condition. But so for some women, if they have they have a genetic uh, you know um, tendency of having that disease, and then it's now mixed together with uh, you know their lifestyle. Uh, this can predispose them more to having uh, that uh, condition. So uh, usually uh, the diagnosis of polycystic ovary is there's a retinal criteria using clinical symptoms, laboratory symptoms, and then ultrasound finding. But only two of the symptoms uh, are needed. 
to, to make the diagnosis of that. So okay. if a woman is having menstrual irregularities, if there is, um, you know, has, um, symptoms of, of uh, hyperandrogenism, that's if there is increased testosterone, acne, hair, excessive hair growth, or changing voice, if, if, we, if those two are present, we can see, okay, a woman has PCOS. And then on ultrasound scan, there is a finding that is a presence of small uh, follicles, up to 10 follicles is diagnostic of uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, so about, uh, I think uh, as part of the uh, normal menses, I mentioned that every month one, one follicle or one ova is being recruited for ovulation. So in PCOS, what's happening in, is that instead of one ova to, to be recruited, about 10 will start growing in one month. So the, the hormone that is being released by the brain, that is a follicle stimulating hormone, is now going to act on all those small, small follicles. So the hormone will now be diluted. Instead of it to act on one follicle, it's now acting on 10 follicles. So uh, what, what's going to happen here is that instead of one follicle to grow, the, all the 10 follicles will grow and they will not grow to the capacity of ovulation. So that is the reason why women with PCOS, they don't ovulate every month. It takes them a, a lot of, because of, of that um, uh, hormone imbalance, where even, even if the hormone is there because of those ovaries that are, uh, sorry, not, um, the follicles that are growing, uh, it's not enough for one uh, follicle to grow. So you have an ovulation. And if there is no ovulation, menstruation will be delayed. So they tend to have menstrual irregularities. Wow. But is it also possible to not um, to not come up with symptoms even when one has PCOS? Because I think I remember talking with a lady. She had PCOS, but she didn't know it. It took her a very long time before she got diagnosed. I think um, she had a situation where her menstrual cycle got delayed for some two, three months. So she went for a check because she yeah. wanted to be sure she wasn't pregnant before she discovered she had P um, PCOS and she didn't come up with some of the symptoms you've just mentioned. So is, are there cases like that? Yes, uh, this, these symptoms are different for every woman. It's, it's not the same for everyone. Every woman has some particular symptoms that she might have and not have others. And then um, the thing is, that, as I've mentioned, there is uh, genetics plays a role and also lifestyle plays a role. Um, maybe, uh, maybe your friend is not obese uh, because um, if there's genetic risk factor and then uh, there's overweight, the tends to uh, uh, the symptoms tend to come out early. So possibly your friend is not obese, and then uh, she's um, maybe her lifestyle, her diet is not uh, the type that might precipitate uh, some of the symptoms in her. So this might be this might be a reason why uh, why the symptoms are not there. And I've mentioned that sometimes just an ultrasound scan finding and then. Uh, the menstrual irregularity these two are enough she doesn't she must not have acne or hirsutism to be diagnosed of pcos so if the if, if scan ultrasound scan shows the presence of the cystic ovaries and then menstrual irregularities you see we've, we've gotten two out of the three criteria so a diagnosis of um, pcos can be made all right so are there particular ages that can have PCOS? Like what age range can have PCOS? At what age can one be worried that they can be prone to PCOS or something? And that age associated with, you know, with this? Well, it's, um, it's more of um, disease of the reproductive age. So once a woman is menstruating between, and, and that's between 15 to 45 years old. So that's usually the age range for that kind of, a woman can come up with even though these days PCOS. we have younger children that are actually menstruating yes but uh, in young children we don't make the diagnosis that early because if uh if a, if a teenager or adolescent start menstruating the first two years they usually have menstrual irregularities okay. they might skip a month or two before um without any problem this is just because their body is adjusting to the to the release of these um, uh, menstrual, these hormones that are not there. So um, they can experience menstrual irregularities in the first year, some second year. So if this continues after the first two years and then they're, they're still having that irregularity, then we can 
probe further to see if what, what is causing the irregularities. And then uh, women that are above 40, 45 years, they're in the perimenopausal period. So when uh, menses, when women at that, at that age, their menses has come to an end, so they tend to have menstrual irregularities. So um, I think uh, we have to do further uh, investigations to before saying, that, okay, you're having PCOS at that age. But at that age, can they possibly have PCOS when they are no longer menstruating? <laughs> yes, yes, they can. Really? They can because PCOS is present in, in teenagers also. As early as 16, 17, you can, they can have a diagnosis of PCOS. They can have all the symptoms of PCOS. Okay, so I'm talking about um, from 45. I mean, if one had stopped menstruating, I don't think they can be at risk of PCOS. No, anymore. no, no, <laughs> no, it, it won't be, it won't be present because right. the ovaries are, have stopped functioning, kind of, they're, they've stopped releasing the hormones that are responsible in for bringing this imbalance, they, they are going down, so they won't have these symptoms. All right. Thank you so much. Um, let's go on a quick break now. When we return, we we'll continue the discussion. Viewers, we'll be right back. Welcome back, viewers. This is still Healthy Living, reaching you from the nation's capital, Abuja. And we're still discussing menstrual irregularities with Dr. Miriam Hassan. All right, Dr. Miriam, um, just as we were discussing earlier, you were giving us underst an understanding that PCOS can no longer occur in any woman that has gone past the reproductive age, right? Yes. So what about the um, thoughts that a woman can have PCOS and still be pregnant? Sorry, I didn't get the question. I said, what about the thoughts that a woman can have PCOS and still be pregnant? How possible? You mean a woman conceiving with PCOS? Exactly. Okay, yes, this is one of the um, myths that I've, I've heard a lot, that PCOS is associated with infertility. No. PCOS is not a cause of infertility. However, it can delay pregnancy oh. because it's associated with menstrual irregularities leading to um, an ovulation. There is, a woman is not having ovulation every month, so this can delay her uh, uh, from getting pregnant. But PCOS on its own, it's not a cause of infertility. However, if there are other um, factors that can lead to infertility together with PCOS, then uh, that might be the reason. But PCOS, PCOS on its own is not a cause of infertility. Okay, so how... I'm just surprised that you're saying PCOS is not a cause of infertility because literally everyone believes direct, that. Not a direct cause. It, it can delay... It can delay fertility because of an ovulation, but with um, for some some women, just with uh, dietary modification, weight loss, you know, lifestyle changes, um, studies have shown that their their hormones uh, become becomes regular, and they they start ovulating even without drugs. And then and with ovulation, there's chances of pregnancy. So you see, uh, in this you you can't say that okay. Um, they're infertile. Infertility means inability to conceive. So this yes. woman can conceive. It's just that there is a delay. There's a delay because of lack of ovulation. So once ovulation is corrected in them, they can actually conceive and get pregnant. You know what I'm saying that? If PCOS causes lack of ovulation, so yes. it will simply mean that PCOS, if there's no ovulation, there cannot be fertility, right? So that's why... <laughs> Ordinarily, well, we're not medically inclined. Those of us that are your viewers and your listeners right now, we're not medically inclined. So we're trying to understand where that comes from, the science. If PCOS stops ovulation, so why won't it be that PCOS causes ovulation? I mean, causes infertility, I beg your pardon. It's as a result of infertility. Infertility? Well, I... I, I, I <laughs> Um, it's cause it it doesn't really uh, because uh, it doesn't really affect um, fertility, you know, because uh, there are women that can have uh, PCOS and they can uh, you know um, go ahead to have pregnancy even without without any intervention, without uh, um, you know them being diagnosed infertile. Okay, mm -hmm. so that is the reason why I, I feel it's it's not really a direct cause. Of infertility, you know, you, you, you for example, a woman that has tubal blockage. If there's a tubal blockage, there's 
um, there's no amount of lifestyle modification that you can do. There's no weight loss that you can do to, for you to, to conceive. You have to undergo some, you know, some treatment, uh, either intra, uh, in vitro fertilization and for you to, to have a baby if you have tubal blockage. Well, for a woman with PCOS, it's just a metabolic um, and hormonal disorder, which if corrected, which can, can, can even be corrected without medication and uh, just by lifestyle modification and diet, uh, a woman can, uh, can go ahead to, you know, have ovulation and uh, conceive. I feel it's, uh, we shouldn't say it's a, it's a cause of um, infertility that if you have PCOS, okay, you're not going to have a baby. Once you, uh, you do this, uh, changes this lifetime lifestyle modification uh, the the chances of pregnancy it's Im improves in, in, in most situations uh, but um let me not generalize in some situations even with the um, lifestyle modification supplement or uh, uh, nutritional supplement some women still need some um intervention which could be uh, uh in form of um ovulation induction using ovulation induction drugs that uh, some women are had um, laparoscopic ovarian drilling to help them to have their ovulation or even intra, uh, in vitro fertilization for them to, to have uh, pregnancy. But in some situations, lifestyle modification and also, um, you know, a healthy diet can help to regulate the hormones and can lead to pregnancy. What about the uterine fiber you talked about earlier? Does it also okay, cause um, infertility? Can, yes, the uh, just like um, PCOS, in uterine fibroid, it depends on the location of uh, of the fibroid. Uh, medically, we said there are infertility and and uh, uterine fibroid are causally related, meaning uh, depending on this on its size and location, it can affect fertility. Okay, but just having a fibroid on its own because fibroid can be outside of the womb, it can be by the mouth of the womb. Okay, so it can it in the, if it's not in a way in a in a position where it might block entry of the sperm, or it can block the tubes, or it can be maybe directly inside the womb causing miscarriages. It might you, you a woman can have fibroid and have a normal pregnancy and delivery without the fibroid affecting the pregnancy. But in situation where it is positioned. In a, in, a, in a place that it can either block the tube or prevent implantation in the uterus. It can uh, prevent a woman from conceiving. All right, so when should we become worried when our menstrual cycle becomes, how long should we wait before we get to go to the hospital for clinical checks? Down. Your volume is down. Can you hear me now? Yes. When should a woman become worried when she's having menstrual irregularities, how long should she wait? Okay, well, this depends on the symptoms that, that she's having, okay? Because uh, there are some symptoms that you, you, you have to go to the hospital that same day, depending on, for example, if it's a heavy flow, heavy menstrual flow, passage of clots, uh, passage of blood clots, you can't, you can't stay at home, you have to go to the hospital. But uh, if, for example, if it's a, uh, a, de a delayed menses, your, your period is delayed for a week or two, you can wait and see, okay, maybe it's just a stress and see, okay, what's the next cycle going to be? If your next cycle, it, uh, it goes back to normal, fine. However, if, if, if it's pers persistent for three months, then it's time to go to the hospital. And then when there is um, severe pain during, uh, during your menses, which is called dysmenorrhea, um, menses, menses is associated with some mild pain because of the uterine contraction to expel menstrual blood. However, it's not supposed to be an excruciating pain. It's not supposed to be severe. So if a woman is experiencing severe menstrual cramps, you should go to the hospital. And then, um, okay, yes, if the duration also, if her normal duration is two, let's say five days, six days, and then now she's menstruating for 10 days, 12 days, and it's, there's no sign of it stopping. So you, you shouldn't wait until, okay, the next month you, you go to the hospital to see what's, uh, what's causing the bleeding during that cycle. All right, before we um, talk about how to manage it and possible solutions, looking at it from the medical angle, um, another quick question to you is, does childbirth actually cause uh, menstrual irregularity and how long is it supposed to last if it does? 
Well, um, childbirth does um, after that's the postpartum period, right? Yes. Um, there's a postpartum bleeding. There's bleeding following delivery, and then there's a, a menstruation following delivery. So um, we don't really call it uh, menstrual irregularity, except if it's uh, if uh, it's it's you know if all the the criteria, well, uh, all the you know the pattern the pattern of normal menstrual cycle is not it's not following it but, um let me start with the postpartum bleeding okay uh, after after a delivery a woman bleeds so this this duration also varies just like the mes the menstrual uh, cycle is not the same for every woman postpartum bleeding is also not the same for 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 every woman the average duration is 4 to 6 weeks however some women may have been up to 8 weeks so, okay, so um, you, you won't say uh, there is an abnormality in the postpartum period, except if, unless if the woman is having heavy bleeding, like we mentioned, have using three pads, more than three pads in a day, soaking one pad within an hour, severe pain, maybe fever, and then if the bleeding has um, this foul smelling discharge, so that is not normal. But if the duration has not passed that six to um, four to six weeks is still within um, normal. So this is for the postpartum period. So for some women, after uh, delivery, they, they they might have something called lactational amenorrhea, which is a situation in which there is absence of menses due to breastfeeding. For some, it's just for the first six months, while for others, it may last throughout during the period that they are breastfeeding their baby. So in this situation, uh, you won't call it uh, an irregularity, except if uh, if um, she if maybe there's a breakthrough ble bleeding and then she's bleeding excessively or if she's having irregular spotting, um, okay, you can uh, you can see okay she's having an irregularity, but not seeing menses during the breastfeeding um, period, it's actually normal. Okay, some women might be experiencing they might be experiencing some mild spotting every month. Uh, instead of them, maybe if the normal is three to five days every month and then now they are breastfeeding instead of them seeing their normal uh, menstrual flu they might be seeing some mild spotting during that period and afterwards they won't see any bleeding till another month again this is because the, uh, there is a there's a hormone called prolactin which is responsible for um for breast milk secretion this hormone tends to suppress uh other um menstrual hormones as the follicle the um, sorry, it's suppressed ovulation. So because there is um, an ovulation because of the high prolactin, which is uh, necessary for for lactating mothers, they might that is the reason why they might experience amenorrhea or reduced blood flow, which is hypomenorrhea. So how do we then manage menstrual irregularities? Can you please take us through that? Okay. Um, the management of um, menstrual irregularity, um, first of all, we have to take a detailed history okay, to know um, uh, what, uh, how it started, when it started, how the pattern is, how the deviation from, from normal, and then we have to sort out other associated symptoms that might be um, uh, present because uh, in some, some of the causes that we've discussed earlier are associated with other uh, symptoms that will help us uh, know the um, the cause of, of um, the, what is causing the menstrual irregularity. So, uh, and then family history is important. As I've mentioned, PCOS is, um, is, uh, has um, some genetic, uh, you know, um, um, association. So we would like to know um, all that medical history, um, medical diseases like thyroid disorders, and then drug history, because um, some drugs can lead to uh, menstrual irregularities. So you would like to know which drugs is this patient taking? So after taking a detailed history, you've, uh, um, you've uh, you know learned about all the associated symptoms that uh, the the woman is having. Then you will do a, a, an examination, examination to check um, what uh, if there is any physical you know physical uh, symptoms that the woman is having. Then. Uh, after examination, we check the womb, you know, vaginal exa pelvic examination to see if there is presence of maybe uterine fibroid, which can be in a form of, uh, you know, lower abdominal swelling and uh, all that. And then uh, we'll do laboratory investigation, blood work. Um, 
one of the causes of menstrual irregularity is hormonal uh, imbalance. Okay, so doing a blood work, doing a hormonal assay to check the levels of these hormones, which one is elevated, which one is it's low. This can help us pinpoint and see what is the um, cause. Other investigations that can be done is um, pelvic ultrasound scan to see, to look at the, the uterus as there are uterine causes that can cause um, bleeding. And then we can do a uh, hysteroscopy, which is, is, is um, uh, a bit um, higher than ultrasound scan to look at directly into the womb to see what is um, causing uh, the menstrual irregularity. So basically these are the investigations that we do the um, laboratory workup, which is the blood work, and then radiological investigations. So together with um, taking a detailed history and examination, you can uh, uh, you can determine what is the cause of um, menstrual irregularity in a woman. Okay, so for um, a woman now, what, that's the medical angle. So what would be your advice to women on how to manage menstrual irregularities? At, uh, what, what we discussed about uh, the, risk, the risk factors, we mentioned stress, stress to be part of the causes of menstrual irregularity. So um, one has to, has to look for a way to manage uh, stress, okay? Um, you, you, you have to get enough sleep, at least eight hours of sleep, that's the ideal. Okay, and then uh, if, if you're having, uh, if in women that do intense exercise, it, which it can be a form of stress, where, um, it should be reduced. And then, um, you know, relaxation techniques to help reduce uh, stress because stress is associated with menstrual irregularity. Okay, and then uh, in, in situations where uh, a woman has PCOS and is, she has, um, she's obese, Okay, there is a need for lifestyle modification, not just only because of the PCOS or menstrual irregularity. There are other medical conditions that are associated with overweight and obesity. So it's good to, to you know, have uh, an idea to have your, the body mass index to be within the normal, to the normal rate. Okay, to have to, to eat healthy, avoid junks, you know, avoid or reduce um, carbs in our diet, avoid dietary products, especially for women that have um, um, PCOS. And then, um, you know, um, okay, then mostly lifestyle modification, it, it works for them. And then uh, use of a nutritional supplement in situations where, uh, where the, the needs are, are not met uh, from, from diet. All right, we've always heard, I heard from a doctor that healing is waiting. I mean, waiting is healing, I beg your pardon. So does that ap apply to menstrual irregularities too? So you can know, you come often, again? Uh, okay, I've heard from a doctor that waiting is healing. I know there are often times that sometimes you just experience some sort of irregularity in your system and then you take a break and everything just normalizes. So does that apply to menstrual irregularity too? <laughs> It's skipping. I didn't get what you said. Okay, I'll take it again. I said I've heard from okay. a doctor that waiting is healing. Can you hear me? Waiting what? Okay, waiting, waiting is, healing. is healing. Yes. So yes. does okay, that apply on. to menstrual irregularity too? Knowing that there are times that some things may happen to us and we may just take a break and hold on and then we get back better. So does that apply to menstrual irregularity well, um, yes and no. Okay. Okay. Um, in in some situations where um, where the irregularity is is severe, um, for example, if a woman is having um, increased menstrual flow, increased duration of menses, it means that she's losing more blood. Okay. So um, saying waiting is healing, it, it won't apply to this uh, situation because the more she bleeds the more she waits the more she bleeds and the, uh, and if she's bleeding this can affect her okay but in situation maybe if uh, it's uh, it's a delay in menses here she's not losing blood and then uh, it's and it's, it's not like the menstrual blood is accumulating in the womb just like 
some women say if they don't menstruate, it's like the the menstrual blood is accumulating in the womb. It's, it's not it's not like that in this situation. So if a woman is having um, just a delay in menses. As we said, if it's not, you have to even wait for at least three months to see if it's not persistent. So you see, waiting is healing can apply to this situation because um, if it is due to stress, uh, you're, you're having some delay due to stress. If you if you wait for for at least two three months and then your cycle is back to normal, then that means uh, you see waiting uh, the the waiting period is uh, is beneficial in this situation. So we have to look and see what is it that. What 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 form of irregularity are we are we dealing with? Is it excessive um, blood loss? Is it severe pain? If it is something that needs urgent intervention, it's best to go to the hospital. Okay, uh, because we touched on PCOS a little, um, and we're rounding up now. I want you to help us touch on how to also manage PCOS or how to you know um, resolve it totally. Is there a solution to it, and how can it be managed if there's no solution? Okay. Um, you see, the management of PCOS depends on on uh, the symptoms and then, uh, you know, the choice of the woman. Some women might have PCOS, they have, they have menstrual irregularities, and then uh, they have other symptoms like acne, um, uh, you know, it's hair loss, hirsutism, and all that. And then they are not ready for pregnancy. So you see, this is different. While others, they have all these symptoms, and they want to conceive. So you see, the part of the treatment might be the same while, well, because this one is trying to conceive might be different from the one that is not trying to conceive. So in, but in women that are not trying to conceive, you help them uh, regulate the menses, okay? This can be by lifestyle modification, weight loss. It is said that if, uh, if the woman is overweight or obese, losing at least 10% of the weight can help uh, uh, the message to, to go back to normal and then if she's experiencing acne uh, she can be placed on some uh, uh, medications or, or you know advice to use you know moisturizers that have um, hyaluronic acid it helps with acne or um, you know uh, using um, so what's um, jojoba oil? Jojoba oil is said to help with acne because it, it is, it's non-greasy. So you can uh, advise a woman to use that. And then uh, depending on all the symptoms, depending on the symptoms that she's presenting with. So for a woman that is trying to conceive with PCOS, you see this alone will not work. You have to uh, you have to okay work towards helping her conceive. So if she she will still go on weight loss, she will still go on the dietary modification and all the um, other uh, treatment for the symptoms that she having. But in this situation, you have to like okay, um, place her probably on uh, fertility supplements. You can uh, go for ovulation induction or other uh, treatments that will help her ovulate and help her conceive. Okay. Okay. So some of the uh, nutritional supplements that can help with uh, women with PCOS is uh, there is a Mayo Inositol. It's a, a nutritional supplement that is found to help regulate menses. Other supplements are folic acid, vitamin B complex. They are all found to help regulate menses. And then in and then also there is this N acetyl cysteine and L carnitine. They are all supplements that the studies have shown to help uh, you know help improve the quality of the ova and also help uh, women with menstrual irregularities. All right, um, before we round up, there's this myth I want you to clarify. A lot of women believe that during menstruation, there are some things you shouldn't do, there are some things you should avoid, like do not take milk, do not um, use shampoo on your hair, do not apply some things on your skin because your body is open. So can you just help us um, either, are you agreeing to that or you're refuting that? No, no, <laughs> no. Um, well, uh, for for pregnancy, maybe the because you know whatever you apply to the skin, it's being absorbed and it goes into the blood. But if a woman is not pregnant, I don't think it's except the, if if the shampoo is well, if the shampoo is even in the market, that means it has been it has gone through all the uh, necessary steps to ensure that it's a good one okay so um i don't think there's anything associated with using creams or shampoos but using hair i do know of using hair relaxer when uh, a woman is pregnant because in that situation you're carrying a baby meaning uh, and and the baby is just a developing fetus doesn't have 
all the excretory mechanism, the liver, the kidney, they are not as developed as it is in us. So it's best to uh, you know pre, um, avoid those um, um, cosmetics or you know most skin moisturizers or what have you. But during menses, you know, it doesn't it doesn't affect it doesn't have any effect. All right. So your final advice to every woman out there. Okay. Um. Uh, it's, uh, my advice is to to know about uh, mes menstrual health is important. Okay, we, we menstruate for almost all our, our lives because the reproductive age is between fifteen to forty-five years. That's a good thirty years. If you if that's half of our life, so it's good to know about about um, about menses to know what is normal, what is abnormal. Okay. And, and then what is when to go to the hospital because this is very important but uh, menstrual health is important menstrual hygiene is important so my advice is know about the normal menstrual cycle know when it is abnormal and you should know when to go to the hospital all right thank you very much dr Mira. we really appreciate you okay, and thank you your time. thank you olamide for having me on your interesting program it's I been really a pleasure talking you. to you thank you so much Thank All you. our viewers, that's where we round up the show for today. I'll see you again next week. I am Olamide Al-Hassan.